All right, thanks for bearing with us. Um, I'm Sam. Uh, my name is Javon, and uh, we're going to talk to you today about tricks. It is a new rich text editor for the web. And uh, first, we want to tell you about a problem we kept running into and uh, show you how to solve it. We work at Basecamp, and Basecamp is a product management tool that's used by millions of people worldwide. And at Basecamp, we believe that project management is communication. And so writing is a core feature of our product. And people do a lot of writing in Basecamp. Uh, since 2004, over 832 million messages, documents, and comments have been written in Basecamp. And that means a lot of people interact with our text editor. Um, when you're communicating online without body language or vocal intonation, formatting is communication. Um, emphasis is often essential to getting your point across. Making headlines bold, formatting lists can really help clarify what you're trying to say. Uh, so how does Basecamp handle text formatting? In 2004, we launched Basecamp um, with support for textile formatting in messages and comments. For those of you who don't know, textile is a plain text syntax that's similar to Markdown. And textile and Markdown are both easy to implement, but they're not a good experience for non-technical people. Uh, what we really wanted is WYSIWYG. But in 2004, web browsers didn't support WYSIWYG. Um, and that's not totally true. In fact, there was one browser that did support it. Um, in 1999, Microsoft released Internet Explorer 5.5, and they actually snuck in a WYSIWYG editor. Um, they snuck it in because they needed it for another product of theirs. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers this. This is Microsoft's front page. Um, it's a a full-blown web, um, website tool. It's a WYSIWYG HTML publisher, and it used uh, Internet Explorer internally as its rendering engine. And so for over half a decade, we all know Internet Explorer uh, dominated, and it was the only browser that supported WYSIWYG editing. But eventually the other browsers started to catch up uh, because they wanted WYSIWYG editing too. And so they copied what Microsoft did. But the problem is that Microsoft didn't document or specify its APIs at all. So the APIs were a black box and the other browsers had to reverse engineer them. So this API is known as Content Editable. Um, content Editable is an attribute that you can put on any, any uh, element on a web page, and it turns that element into a full-blown WYSIWYG editor. Um, here's a little um, video I made. I'm studying Content Editable on the New York Times body tag, and you can see the browser just turns the full page into an edit, a, a WYSIWYG editor. You can um, move stuff around, you can format, you can drag things, you can delete things, um, and this is all built into pretty much every web browser now because Microsoft needed it for front page in 1999. Um, so like doing something like this, like this isn't very uh, useful. I mean, it's fun, but it's not really usable as a tool. So how do you build a text editor with content editable? Well, there's a related API called exec command. And you use it in conjunction with content editable to perform formatting operations on the focused content editable element. And so in most WYSIWYG editors, um, most of them that use exact command, at least. When you click a formatting button, such as bold, um, the editor calls exec command bold, and uh, the browser applies formatting to the, the active content editable element. Um, because all other browsers had to essentially reverse engineer what Microsoft did to implement content editable, they all have slightly different behavior. Um, for example, 
when you press return in a content editable element, uh, you might get a BR tag, you might get a div with a BR in it, or you might get a paragraph. Um, it depends even on what element you press return inside of. Um, editing bulleted lists has similarly inconsistent results. And um, why is this a problem? Is it a problem? Well, if you want to extract any meaning from the resulting document that you just edited, um, how do you do that when it can be structured in any number of ways? How do you style a paragraph if it's not a paragraph tag? Maybe it's a PR, maybe it's a div. Um, how do you handle editing something in Chrome that was composed in Firefox? If you're using content editable and exec command, uh, pretty much your only option is to wait for the content and the editor to change, watch for that to happen, and then attempt to normalize the HTML afterwards. And as you might imagine, this quickly becomes a game of whack-a-mole, um, especially when these behaviors aren't documented anywhere at all. And unfortunately, this is what the browser vendors gave us. And historically, it's all we've had to work with. But despite these problems, the promise of WYSIWYG is too good to pass up. And so in 2008, we embarked on our first attempt at Basecamp to add a WYSIWYG editor. Uh, we looked around at existing uh, open source editors, and uh, we, we found that they were all too complex. They tried to do too much. Uh, they're designed for editing any kind of HTML you can imagine. They're full-page website, web page editors. These things want to be Microsoft Word, but we just want to compose a comma. And so at Basecamp, we're, we're champions of simplicity. And so we built our own editor. And uh, even with just these four formatting options that we provided, uh, dealing with the browser inconsistencies from content editable and exec command, was a challenge, and we had lots of bugs. So fast forward to 2012, uh, we've launched a new version of Basecamp, Basecamp 2. And we thought, surely someone else has solved these WYSIWYG editing problems by now. It's, it's been around since 1999. Um, somebody's figured out how to do it. And so we looked for a third party WYSIWYG editor. We found one that looked nice. We used it, we customized it, and we thought, surely this will solve our problems. And there are still bugs. Um, so to be A37 signals, it would be really great if line breaks were not inserted in weird places when I quote text, this editor sigh. Selecting text and then applying bold makes the text disappear. And these are all customer emails that we've received. The editor knows it's bold, but it's impossible to deselect. Now everything is bold. Uh, move the pointer to the previous line, and you would not be able to add anything after the bullet. But your text editor makes me sad. Lots of time spent wrangling bullets that appear randomly where I don't want them, etc. Couldn't get a single bullet to appear no matter what I did. I'm trying to post a new message, and it will not remove two bullets that are in the body of the text. Nor will it let me add text. And so it's clear that chasing exec command, cleaning up after content editable's mess is a losing battle. If you need proof, aside from the customer emails we just shared, just look at the issue trackers for the existing WYSIWYG editors. This is the one we use in Basecamp 2 for open issues on GitHub. Here's another major editor, 2300 open issues. Yet another editor, 2200 open issues. Um, I'm convinced that there are approximately 2200 possible content editable bugs in, in the world. And so here we are in 2015, and editing rich text on most websites is objectively worse than it was on the original Macintosh in 1984. And at some point, we got embarrassed and frankly fed up with the situation at Basecamp. And so we put, it, we put together a team to 
take a serious look at building a new editor because again text is critical to our business and these bugs are just not good and so we, we, we know it's possible to do WYSIWYG editing well there are a couple of really good examples um, Apple Pages is uh, an incredible piece of software and the way it works is by trapping all keyboard input and mouse input and we draw the entire UI using SVG. Not content editable, I guess. An incredible the... feat of engineering. Probably took a massive, a massive team uh, a long time to create this. And um, this is Google Docs. Similarly, it traps all keyboard and mouse input. Uh, it, it draws its entire UI with HTML. And in the, if you look closely, it, it draws the cursor itself. So obviously it's not using content editable. Um, you look closely, the cursor is just a little div that they uh, make blink. And have you ever actually thought about how you'd implement cursor movement on your own? It's not trivial. And trying to imagine doing it with the web API is even, even less so. And each operating system does it differently. Uh, you'd have to emulate native behavior, native selection behavior, native keystrokes. But we actually tried doing it this way. We tried doing it like Apple and Google, and it's hard. We have a, we have a small team at Basecamp. Uh, I think we're just 13 programmers now, um, supporting millions of customers. So we have to choose what we work on uh, and, and address problems in a way that companies with large teams can. And uh, doing it this way is really hard. It doesn't feel native. And crucially, in 2015, it doesn't work well on mobile. Um, you'll notice even Google Docs drops down to a plain text mode if you open it in a mobile web browser. So Sam and I uh, took a step back and said, uh, took a look at what content editable is actually good for. What's it good at? Uh, this thing that we've hated for so long. It's good at moving the cursor. It's good at making selections. It's not good at editing content. Content editable is not good at editing content. But um, we wanted to explore if we could uh, build on the things it's good at. We had this idea to treat content editable as an IO device. Um, so what if we could just use it for cursor movement and selections, and then we owned the content of the content editable ourselves, rendered everything into it, moved the cursor appropriately. So we tested our theory, and it proved viable. And then we spent the last 18 months working on it. And today, uh, the end result is Trix, and we're really excited to share it with you. Um, Trix sidesteps all of the problems that we described with content editable simply by treating the content editable element as an I.O. device, it's not a HTML editor. And um, here's what Trix looks like in Basecamp. It's a quick little video. Um, and I guess to sort of expand on what we mean by treating content editable as I.O., um, when, input, when, when, we, um, when input comes into the editor, we transform that input into an operation on an internal Trix document, and then we re-render the entire content of the content editable element. Um, this gives us complete control over what happens after every keystroke, and it avoids the need to ever use exec command. So let's illustrate exactly what happens when you press a key in a Trix editor, and then it appears in your document. Uh, we take this key press, we receive an input event. Trix turns the input event into an editing operation. Then it applies that editing operation to its internal document and performs an update. The update triggers a render. The document renders in response. And you see your character appear on screen. So uh, here's a simple document inside of a Trix editor. 
Uh, you can see it has a, a block quote, and that block quote is all italic. And one of those words is bold. And then we have another line uh, with just no formatting at all. And um, here's a little peek of how Trix models that internally. Um, a Trix document is composed of a series of block objects. You can see two block objects here. The first one is that quote, and uh, it contains a quote attribute. Every block has a text object, and a text object is made up of a series of pieces. Those pieces also contain formatting attributes. So you can see our first line, the first piece is italic, the second piece is italic and bold, which is that word after, and the third piece is just italic. And our, our, our second block just has an unformatted piece. Um, conceptually, though, the document can be thought of as a collection of characters. And each cursor position inside of a Trix editor maps directly to a position inside of our Trix document. So every time you're editing, every time you're typing, you're editing, you're editing a precise segment of a document. You're not editing a selection of HTML. Um, so no matter how many elements your selection spans, uh, no matter what formatting it goes through, you're always performing an edit on a selection of a Trix document. Um, uh, so if we were to hit bold now with this selection and apply bold to uh, a selection that spans two blocks and some different formatting attributes, um, and this is how we would look afterwards. This is the resulting document. Um, Trix knows how to handle a selection that spans anything and intelligently splits where necessary the pieces and applies formatting directly to those pieces. Um, but obviously there's more to rich text than just uh, writing letters, uh, typing characters. Right, so Trix has great support for embedded attachments um, and internally each attachment in a Trix document is represented by a single character, and that character has a position. And what that uh, what that does for us is it gives us the ability to move the cursor around as a single object. So again, we built this reliable way to map any DOM selection to a cursor to a position into the document. And in addition to that, we store all attachment metadata as attributes on the attachment character. We also uh, built an immutable document model for Trix. Um, it's built with immutable objects, and what that means is each time you make a change in the editor, we swap in a new document. Each change results in a new document. The new document shares all the parts that are unchanged with the previous document. And immutability gives us some really great benefits. Uh, for one, it's easy to cache views because we know what objects have changed and what objects haven't. So we only have to render the new stuff. Also, we get undo for free. To maintain an undo history, we just keep a copy of each document at every point in your editing session. You can roll back or forward at any time. And so immutability is memory efficient and it's performant. We also designed the document model to losslessly round trip to and from HTML. That means if you copy and paste from one Trix editor to another, or you save a Trix document's HTML to a database and load it back, you always get the same document. Even if it's in Chrome and you edit it in Firefox or Internet Explorer. The combination of lossless round tripping and a well-defined mapping from DOM DOM selection to document position uh, makes editing and tricks incredibly consistent and reliable. But how do you actually use this in your app? So after including uh, Trix's single JavaScript file, all you need to do is drop in our, um, our custom Trix editor element onto your page. Um, we have become big fans of custom elements uh, specifically for one reason. One, they look cool. It's sort of like having a, a vanity light display. Um, but two, 
They allow you to define what are known as life cycle events, uh, which means they can execute code when they're created, when they're attached to a page, or when they're removed from a page. And we take advantage of this to automatically initialize tricks as soon as one of these elements is inserted to a page. There's no configuration required. Um, there's optional configuration, but this is the bare minimum you need to do to install a tricks editor onto your page. And uh, building on top of that, we've, we've um, Trix's API hangs directly off of these elements. So once you have a Trix editor on the page, you can interact with its editing API. You don't need to know anything about Trix internals. The editor API lets you drive Trix with high level commands. So here I'm inserting a string into an editor. I'm setting the selection from zero to five and then I'm applying bold to that selection. Um, and you can build really cool stuff with its API. Um, we've been using it for the new version of Basecamp that's launching soon, and here's a couple examples. Uh, Basecamp allows you to embed uh, many types of links in, uh, right inside of documents. And let's make sure how it works like. Um, so this is a tool for embedding tweets directly in your document, and because we can treat tweets like attachments we saw earlier, the tweet itself is functionally one character in the document. You can hop the cursor over it, and you can backspace right through it. We also built a feature that lets you add mention anyone in Basecamp from inside tricks. Um, and these mentions are just attachments in your document. They're right in line there. And uh, we just use this public editor API to insert them into the document. Um, so this, this uh, suggestions drop down is implemented outside of the editor, and we just insert a, an attachment there. Um, these are just a couple of examples of the, the kind of thing you can build with tricks. Um, we are really excited to open this up to the world. And we're debuting it next week uh, when we launch the all-new version of Basecamp, Basecamp 3. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Um, we're also open sourcing it today. So uh, we don't have the website done quite yet, but uh, if you go to this URL, you'll be taken to the GitHub page. Um, and yes, you can, you can download it. Today. So, so. Thank you for coming out. Yeah, yeah, we have time for questions. Go ahead. Yeah. So the question was, um, how do you uh, how do you insert first? How do you insert arbitrary HTML into a Trix document? And the second question was, how do you handle pasting from, for example, Microsoft Word into Trix? And historically, both of those have been pretty difficult. Um, but really, that's I would say that's kind of the same question. It's mm -hmm. all handled by our HTML parser, uh, which is what enables the round tripping through. Uh, our output back into the, the Trix document model. And so we don't support arbitrary HTML, but we do have a well-defined mapping from uh, arbitrary HTML. So for example, Trix doesn't have support for tables, but if you were to paste the table, it will do its best to preserve its formatting. So if you were to load arbitrary unknown HTML, it will I mean, it's potentially lossless or lossy in that case, uh, but you won't lose your data. You'll just lose some of the, the, the structuring format. And as far as pasting from Word, um, you do get a lot of garbage, obviously, in the HTML that you get there, but uh, two things have changed with the situation recently. Browsers um, all support the paste event now quite well, 
Firefox was a holdout for a long time, but now it supports it quite well. Um, so we can get the actual HTML content. The, the, uh, the one browser that doesn't support it is Safari. And I think you know the story behind that, right? Yeah, it was, uh, they removed, uh, 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 well, uh, they support uh, the paste event, but they, they kind of mangle HTML that comes in over the paste event. It's actually that they don't support copying from Safari back into Safari in another content editor. Well, to work around like a Microsoft Excel bug from like 2007, anyway. Um, but anytime a change happens inside of the um, tricks editor that we didn't detect, like we didn't understand, it could have been uh, uh, an unknown input event, or say you double click and right click, open up the edit menu and correct spelling. Uh, the browser doesn't give you much information when that happens. Tricks basically just reparses everything inside of it through its HTML parser again, gives you the best looking document again. Generally, that is unnoticeable. It feels like the thing you wanted to happen happened. We use uh, Mutation Observer to detect changes to the document that way. Um, and when we reparse the document, uh, we do our best to map. Uh, the new documents objects to the existing documents objects, and so it works well with our immutable model. We are the question was what's the minimum browser requirement? Um, if you go to the GitHub page, we have a we have our CI results right there, and I think they're up to date. But basically, we're targeting all evergreen browsers, um, so any any browser that's self-updating. Um, so IE eleven, IE eleven, the rest are all. And this does work in mobile browsers as well. Um, So the question was, do we use a virtual DOM to re-render? Um, and you're right that it is similar to the way React works. But it's also just basic MVC. Um, you have a, a, a document model, and you observe changes, and then you render in response. And um, we, don't, we don't use a virtual DOM, but we do make use of heavy caching. So we render, uh, we render DOM elements, and we associate them with document objects internally by an internal ID. And every time we render, when we do a fresh render, we clone those nodes, which is pretty fast, and uh, perform a, a full insert on the tree. So while it doesn't necessarily perform the minimum number of operations in the way React does, um, it, it is it's quite fast. It, it only takes a few milliseconds to render a, even a large trix document again. Maybe to expand on that, um, Trix does not um, trap input. It listens for input. So when you type a character into an editor, the native character appears immediately as if it was just a regular content editable. But we're also recording that input, processing it through our model, essentially rendering in the background and comparing what's on screen to what we want to be on screen. And if it's exactly what we want, we don't have any reason to render it again. So this allows, if you're just typing a sentence, chances are content editable didn't mess that up too bad. But if you hit return in a bulleted list, and what content editable did didn't match what our internal model says should, uh, how our internal model, model should render, then we take over and replace what was on screen. So we're constantly rendering in the background and only rendering to, to or syncing, we call it. We, yeah, we, uh, we draw a distinction to... between render and sync. So a render is internally uh, creating those, those, cloning those DOM nodes, and then a sync is when we actually swap it into the document. If you're in the browser where all the content is you have We're using Mutation Observer to uh, uh, to detect changes to the document, and while that isn't synchronous with the change, 
it seems to happen fast enough that uh, you don't notice any visual artifacts. So yeah, that, that was a big deal for us. We wanted to make sure that it, there was no flicker in editing. Uh, that's one of the things that makes it feel really bad when you're typing. I, I, I think like worst case is a bullet appears very briefly when it shouldn't have occasionally in some browsers. But it's, uh, I, I'd say recently, we've been using it uh, internally for a good year now, and I haven't noticed anything like that. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>